uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, participating in the meetup. Uh, this one is the Edge AI Labs uh, second uh, session for this year. Um, so to give a quick uh, background on what this meetup is about, I think uh, there are uh, some people who always uh, join MLT meetup and there are also some people who are joining this meetup for the first time. So let me just quickly give a background of uh, what Machine Learning Tokyo uh, meetups are about. So Machine Learning Tokyo, as you know, is like an award-winning nonprofit organization, Ippan Shadan Hojin, uh, which is based on uh, Japan. So it's a, it's dedicated to uh, main three. It's dedicated to uh, democratize machine learning through these three main O's: uh, open education, open source, and open science. We uh, try to focus our uh, goals uh, of machine learning Tokyo around these three main uh, topics. And uh, we are an international uh, research and engineering community of uh, about almost uh, 7,000 members. Uh, so it's a quite uh, huge community and it's growing day by day at a really good scale. Uh, so uh, uh, with this, uh, with Machine Learning Tokyo, we have different channels uh, inside Machine Learning Tokyo. So as you know, uh, on every weekend, we have so many different uh, meetups and workshops. Uh, related to uh, past book sessions or related to uh, reinforcement learning groups, related to uh, EDA, or uh, so, or, and also uh, sessions related to maths. So, uh, similar way, we also have uh, Edge AI uh, Lab uh, community inside Machine Learning Tokyo. This idea actually uh, uh, like originated la uh, last year. So last year, uh, we uh, a couple of uh, MLT, uh, a couple of like uh, engineers, uh, like uh, researchers, engineers, and some uh, IoT engineers, we gathered together and uh, we visited a farm in Chiba. This farm was uh, hosted, uh, like uh, this farm was hosted by a Hacker Farm, and they were looking for some solutions for uh, in order to deploy a, a robotic arm uh, uh, around the greenhouse. Uh, in order to uh, like uh, improve the process. So we just visited, we saw what are the problems in uh, the real field and then we did some brainstorming. We also published a paper uh, in Durex last year uh, based on the uh, solution. And then uh, that was, I think, the starting of uh, AGI Lab. Like maybe uh, we have a small community of uh, people who are interested in uh, deploying on hardware, deploying on edge. So uh, this year we start, uh, made our first uh, session uh, in our, in February, and it was uh, mostly uh, based on uh, actual workshops. So we gathered together on Saturday, and uh, like we gathered total like I I think for uh, three, four hours, uh, we came together. We had the hardware ready. Uh, the hardware was provided by Robot Club. So we had uh, boards like the Google Cor Coral board. We have Jetson Nano, Arduino, and also a range of sensors. So it was more like a idea uh workshop where like you are free to do whatever you want, whatever ideas you want. Uh, you want to try out uh, a break. It, it, it was fine even to break anything, uh, like I mean, uh, while experimentation. So uh, that was our like uh, that idea initiated as like a uh, first session for the AGI lab. So uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, so and uh, after that first uh, session, we thought like yeah, maybe we should have this like there is a continuous growing community inside Machine Learning Tokyo, which is who likes to do edge related uh, projects or edge related uh, work. So uh, we thought like uh, we would uh, want to share. Uh, so recently we did a project and we thought like we would share our uh, experiences based uh, uh, with edge related projects to uh, the entire community and then also we can uh, have an open discussion on uh, those projects so today's session is basically like uh, it will be an open session on uh, with a base information from this project so that uh, we can uh, freely talk uh, about any of the points uh, or how difficulties which generally occur in the when it comes to deploying to edge yeah. so uh, so uh, for this session we have uh, allowed uh, all the participants to unmute their mic so if you if any if at any point if you guys have any question or uh, you guys want to uh, discuss more on that particular topic uh, please unmute yourself and then uh, speak your uh, say your name and uh, and then uh, uh, mention what question or whatever 
discussion topic you want to uh, uh, put in. So, uh, the, uh, but yeah, so uh, because it is like uh, we allow everyone to speak uh, in this uh, session, uh, just uh, we need to remember the code of conduct uh, back in the mind. Uh, like, I mean, we don't want to enforce uh, uh, like a uh, policing policy, but uh, this is uh, because this is an open community, I think we uh, focus more on you know, openness, respect for each other, integrity, and uh, we also want to empower each, uh, each of the members uh, uh, with, without any bias or without any discrimination. Uh, but if, even if like uh, there are if there are some uh, like I mean if we find any uh, like I mean not find if we found like some uh, any harassment or discrimination of any kind uh, maybe uh, like here it says like if uh, if we found any uh, violation of code of conduct we might uh, consider to take some action but yeah and also one another thing is like uh, we strictly say no to recruiters and consultants who look to hire or sell products uh, with MLT event because this is an open community uh, 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 focused on open source, open education and open science. Uh, we don't allow recruiters and consultants to sell their products. So with that, uh, so let me get to the agenda for the today's session. Uh, this is the agenda. Uh, before that, if you are new to uh, this community, uh, please access this uh, Slack channel. Uh, we have a Slack channel, AJI Lab, H underscore AI underscore Lab on MLT's uh, Slack. Uh, so please join this. Uh, this link is also present on the meetup page. Uh, so you can access the meetup page from there. And um, uh, if you have any points or any uh, uh, discussions, if we, uh, if uh, if time doesn't permit, then we can have a discussion on this channel. Also, another thing, uh, like uh, Susanna mentioned in the Zoom chat, also we are recording this video, so uh, so uh, we will not uh, upload it quickly. Uh, so, uh, if you prefer uh, your uh, uh, your video or your uh, uh, audio not to be included in the video, let us know. Uh, we can later edit it. So, uh, so let's jump into the presentation. Uh, so, uh, first is like about the competition. So, what competition? Uh, I want to introduce like which competition we uh, we were trying to work on. So, uh, this competition was held uh, was called as the third AJI competition, and it was hosted by METI. METI means like the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry uh, in Japan, and the NEDO. NEDO is like New Energy and Industrial. De Technology Development Organization in Japan. So the both of these organizations hosted this competition on uh, the Signet platform, and uh, this competition was open to everyone. So uh, also it was like uh, uh, free of cost. So so uh, so the main aim of this competition was to detect bounding boxes for cars and pedestrians and track the object throughout the video. The video data, as you see here, like the video data is captured from uh, captured from the front camera of the vehicle, uh, and the uh, it is from Tokyo or Shibuya area. Uh, so this data was provided by the uh, by the competition organizers itself, and the evaluation strategy uh, was based on MOTA score, uh, multiple object tracking accuracy score. So uh, based on this score, uh, all the submissions, all the uh, models were evaluated. Uh, okay. So let me introduce the team uh, with which we worked on this particular competition. So uh, first is Alisha. Alisha is the co-director of MLT. Alisha, can you say hi or wave a wave a hand? Uh, hello. Yeah. So so Alisha is co-director of Machine Learning Tokyo. Uh, he is also a machine learning engineer and a computer vision researcher. Right now he is pursuing his PhD uh, at University of Tsukuba. Then we have Ben, uh, Benjamin. Uh, so Benjamin, uh, can you say hey. hi? Yeah. So Ben is an engineer working on drones, robots, and uh, he is really interested in AGI uh, related projects. Uh, then we have Katosan. Katosan, can you say hi or hi. Wave, wave your hand? Yeah. So Katosan is a software engineer in Rakuten. He is interested in competitive programming, uh, computer vision, and algorithms, and he also likes maths. Uh, then uh, we have Naveen. Naveen, can you say hi or wave a hand? Yeah. So Naveen is a senior technical scientist at Rikin. Uh, 
uh, he is a AI expert actually, and uh, he likes to experiment with uh, latest uh, edge edge hardware boards. Like he always keeps on like even on Twitter, he always keeps on posting like, okay, I got this particular board and testing this. And uh, finally, me. Uh, so I am a co-founder with machine uh, co-founder of Machine Learning Tokyo, and uh, definitely I like to work on edge uh, AI related or hardware related projects. They are so exciting for me. Uh, I also work in uh, uh, Rapiden and I am leading a small team of machine learning engineers. So with this team uh, introduction, uh, let me uh, uh, share what kind of solution which we developed with this team for the competition. So uh, this is the uh, solution which we developed. It is a two-stage solution. So the first stage consists of object detection, uh, which uses RetinaNet as its model. Uh, we also use batch augmentation uh, to process the frames before uh, feeding to the object detection module. And the second stage is the tracking module. The tracking module, uh, object tracking module uses a Hungarian algorithm. Uh, in here, we also use position speed and visual features to track uh, objects. Uh, here is the like rough timeline for which we worked on this project. Uh, uh, we had about two months uh, till the deadline uh, of this project. Uh, so we started our work uh, in the initial, like I think first week of May. Um, yeah, most of the time we worked on uh, every weekend, uh, mostly on Saturdays. And uh, we had a sync up meetings on Sunday uh, to catch up uh, for any uh, blockers or any progress. Uh, yeah, I think as we entered this end part of the month, like end part of June, uh, I think uh, this happens in most of the project, like things become very uh, busier and uh, deadlines are uh, hard to push. So uh, we had to push our team to submit a better model here. And the result of this was like we secured a third rank uh, in the entire uh, in the in the competition. Uh, it we got a gold medal for that. And in total, I think uh, thirty yeah in total thirty four teams applied uh, for the competition. And out of that, we had a third rank. So uh, with this uh, as an overview of the project, uh, I would like to hand over to Ben uh, for the EDA related work which was which we did in this project. Ben, can you take over? Hi, so I'm Ben, and I'm going to present the uh, ADA we did uh, for this competition. Uh, so the first things you have to do before uh, starting the ADA is like why you're doing that. Um, so what are you looking for? So we were looking for like three points. Uh, the first one is like insight on uh, how to choose a detector. Second one is like, okay, so what kind of tracker we have to implement and what kind of feature we mm -hmm. can extract. And the second one is to find a heuristic to apply to this data set. Uh, so for the two first points, uh, it's the first uh, part of the slide. Uh, we were interesting about like the object size and object scales to know if you have like small bonding box. So in this case, uh, it's a car point of view and the pedestrian are quite small. So we had to choose a detector that are able, uh, is able to find and detect small scales objects. Uh, for the tracking, uh, what important parameter was to find, okay, so how, how about how many objects do we have to track uh, in each frame? And also like what was the ground truth uh, tracking ID uh, policy kind of, uh, is there any obstruction, like some IDs that disappear and reappear uh, in, the, uh, in the video. And if it's the case, it was the case and the tracker need to be designed to manage this such case. And the third point, which is maybe the most important one is to look at the actual images uh, and to, uh, to watch the video and frame by frame. It takes time, but it's really helped to find uh, kind of parameters uh, you want to apply for the augmentation when you train your detector. So it can be the brightness, it can be like uh, the repetition of the bonding box in the image and the different ratio scales. And this brings us to the third point of the uh, purpose of the EDA, which is to find heuristics that you can apply uh, in this data set, precise data set. So heuristic would be like some particular uh, uh, distribution of the data set that is really specific to this data set. And in this competition, uh, what was really important was the position on the bonding box. Uh, this comes off because uh, it's a camera uh, embedded in a car, so it's really a car point of view. And so the repetition of the bonding box and the detection in the frame are car like uh, really related to this point of view. So if you can see the graph on the right side, uh, it's a bonding box center uh, distribution in the frame for one video, I think. And so you can see like uh, it's really follow like a specific uh, distribution. 
And so we can apply heuristics that will uh, eliminate uh, wrong detection or wrong bonding box uh, if they are not belonging to this distribution. Uh, one use case was, uh, for example, in Tokyo, there is a lot of big uh, publicity uh, punk art in the street. And we sometimes detect some person, uh, people in this uh, board. And uh, using this heuristic, we can uh, delete this uh, misdetection for the data set. And so with this uh, first exploration, uh, we selected the, the detector. Uh, and uh, uh, Alicia will speak about uh, all the training uh, and all the tuning we did to tune the detector. OK, thank you, Ben. Uh, so uh, Alicia will explain about the object detection part uh, of this project. Um, okay, so um, so our uh, solution was consisting of two two uh, parts. The first one was object detection, and the second part was object tracking. And I'll be go through on object detection part. Um, and so the, the data provided by the competition was um, uh, about the videos, uh, which captured on uh, on car. The, uh, from the camera which placed it on the car and there were like seven classes in the data and the evaluation was uh, expected to perform on car and pedestrian classes but for the training we have used five classes and I, I will explain why we have used five classes even though the evaluation um, was expected to to uh, done to be done on two classes only and as for framework um, we have used keras retina net um, and as for cnn architecture as a backbone we have used resnet 101 and, and the in, the data resolution was uh, like very huge so the video resolution was very huge um, and we didn't we didn't resize the uh, original video frames, and so we have we have used this huge frames and for the object detection. And the the reason for not resizing was because like in in the left side you can see the pedestrians on the left and right, um, which are very small already. Like if we resize to smaller resolution, then we would we would lose that, those informations. That's why after doing detailed. Uh, um, data analysis. We decided not to resize. Um, yeah, and let me let me also talk about why we have used five classes. Um, so in, you can see the, here's the list of five classes: car, pedestrian, truck, vehicle, and bus. Uh, yeah, as I said, even though the evolution was not running on uh, vehicle, truck, and bus, we have we have uh, uh, used those classes as well because uh, like. Having bus data, having truck data, having vehicle data would would um, help us to um, detect cars uh, from among the, among these classes. So that's why we decided to use those classes as well to be able to discriminate um, from discriminate the car from truck, vehicle, and bus classes. I think there's a question on the chat. There are two bounding boxes: the green and the black one. What do they see signify? Ah, yeah, the green bounding box. The black like, ones uh, is, I guess, the grand uh, bounding boxes, and red ones, and green ones for cars. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, let me just jump in. So, uh, the green are for cars, right? And the red are for pedestrians, right? And the black ones actually are the ground truths, uh, which we uh, overlaid just to uh, visualize uh, the output, right? Uh, yeah, I would come to that point later in the slide where uh, we will be explaining how we did some visual analysis also on these uh, uh, competitions, on, on this data. And there's yeah. another question. Did the competition data included the labels and boxes? Yeah, uh, for the training data, we, we did have labels and um, boxes, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, there's another question. I didn't quite get the reason for using different types of vehicles for cars. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's assume we didn't, we haven't used this vehicle, truck, and bus and data for training. In that case, uh, our model may confuse and uh, cars and buses. So that's why we, uh, for training, we have used all data and uh, to uh, to let the model know 
that car is different from bus and car is different from vehicle and different and different type of vehicles. So that's why you have used different classes, um, not to confuse the model. Uh, trucks too, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. did the competition also provide? Yeah, yeah, they have provided annotations for uh, in total seven classes, and they have used five classes uh, in the training. But the evolution uh, was expected to to run on only two classes. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions. Uh, it helped us to clarify uh, the problem. Okay, let me continue. Um, and I think during the training, uh, as you all already may know that the augmentation is very important uh, in deep learning model training. Uh, in this particular problem, in this particular, particular challenge, and the augmentation was much more important than the other uh, because, uh, in, you know, like since this is real world data, right, which was captured on from real uh, scenes, um, there there could be different variations of the frames. That's that's why we have performed a couple of augmentation. And let me go through uh, one by one. And uh, we have used rotation, um, simply because uh, when the car turns right or turn left, then the frame could could rotate a little bit. So that, that's why we, we decided to use rotation. And as for translation, uh, as for translation, and it is simply because this is a video data and in, in successive frames, and the objects could be translated from, from first frame to the second frame. So that's why translation was important to capture and the objects at every frame. And shearing uh, was also uh, important uh, for the same reason as the rotation one. And for the scaling, as I said, since this is a video data, um, in each frame, the objects appear in different scales. So that's why like scaling would help us capture the objects at every frame. And as for horizontal flip, um, it's like very usual uh, augmentation type. And it's indeed helps to detect some object, even though we, we miss to detect and without this horizontal flip, we will, we will detect when we like do this horizontal flip augmentation. And as for contrast, uh, so as you see in the video, um, the contrast always changes because of this light uh, and uh, different kind of conditions. So that's why like contrast was very important. So what I wanted to say here is um, we didn't use like random augmentation and transformations, but we we have we had some explanations for each of them, and as for object object detection performance, and we got um, for pedestrian we got 0 0.77 average precision, and for car we got 0 0.92 average precision. And just to just to give an intuition about what what the score is, and the state of the art. Um, state-of-the-art models on COCO dataset uh, is usually around 0 0.5. Uh, I'm not saying that we, we, uh, we beat uh, those models, but um, in, in COCO dataset, there are like 47 classes, but in this, in this particular case, there's only two classes, and the average precisions were like this, which, which are pretty good. And the average precision for car is for all type of cars, right? And no, so it's only for for the particular uh, cars, not buses, not uh, trucks, not uh, small vehicles. Uh, and this one is only for for this like uh, classes which are annotated by red bounding uh, green bounding boxes. There's another question for contrast augmentation. Did you do normalization based on the whole scene or the portion of the scenes? And we, we performed the contrast augmentation to the whole scene. Another yeah, question right. for augmentation. Have you tried some other method like cutoff mix up? Um, no, we, we didn't try the cutoff or like uh, mix up uh, approaches simply because we didn't have enough time to do that. And I think uh, we, and we, we we were thinking that the object performance was uh, already pretty good. But yeah, I, I believe that using the mix up and cutoff would be, would help. Um, 
Was the effect of each type of augmentation evaluated to identify the most useful ones? We move to uh, object tracking and now. So for object tracking, uh, Kathosan will explain what uh, what kind of algorithm we use for object tracking. Kathosan, please take it away. Okay. So uh, the tracking module uh, receives bounding boxes uh, predicted by the object detection module. And then uh, the goal of the tracking is uh, to keep assigning the same IDs for the same object as much as possible uh, through all video frames. So oh, here you can see a visualized output of the tracking module. And the same color uh, corresponds to the same ID. And here is the summary of the tracking module. And so let me explain one by one. So next slide, please. Uh, first, uh, to make the problem simple, uh, we formalized the tracking problem as box matching between two adjacent frames. And so here are three frames from left to right in order of the timeline. So uh, for example, uh, there is a pedestrian with white cloth crossing the road in both uh, the first frame and the second frame. So uh, they should be matched and the same ID should be assigned to them. So, and now if we properly define some score function or cost function for every uh, possible matching so that close bounding boxes with similar size and similar image uh, have high score, then we should just find the matching with the highest score in total. And this problem is exactly uh, what is called the maximum weighted matching problem. And it is known to be uh, easily solved by Hungarian algorithm. Uh, but uh, there are some exceptional cases, uh, like uh, for example, uh, there is a pedestrian wearing a black cloth in the first frame, um, but it's occluded by a car in the second frame. So, so there's no proper bounding box to match in the second frame. So uh, to handle this problem, we add uh, partial slots for occluded objects. And if an object has matching with these uh, partial slots, we regard it as occluded by another object. And the similar argument applies to newly appearing objects like uh, the black car in the second frame. So then we can completely formalize this uh, tracking problem as maximum weighted matching problem. Do, uh, so the question is, do you run detections and tracking on each frame? Or do you skip detections on few dramas relying on tracking for going for real time speeds? No, right? Like we process each and every frame, uh, uh, like and run the detections and uh, detections and the tracking on uh, each frame, right? So, so the next step is, uh, so we need to define the score function. So the score function is basically based on box distance and box size difference and uh, box image similarity. And for box distance, the easiest way is to take the distance uh, between the centroids of two bounding boxes directly. Uh, but it can be inaccurate because sometimes uh, objects are moving so fast. So, uh, when comparing objects in the current frame and the next frame, uh, first we predict the next position of an object uh, by quadratic regression with uh, using the past trajectory of the object. Then uh, compare the predicted bounding boxes with the one in the next frame. And for uh, the image similarity, we first resize the uh, two images to the same size and then crop the center parts uh, to remove background, and then blast them to suppress uh, some noises. And after that, uh, we calculate the HSV histogram of the uh, images inside the bounding boxes and take the correlation of them as uh, the image similarity score. And at this time, we didn't have much time to uh, implement, uh, implement more efficient method uh, like uh, re-identification model, uh, but I think it would be much more accurate if we uh, could replace it with uh, that kind of model. Yeah, right, like uh, the re-identification model, well, I think uh, we discussed, but then we hardly had time to 
work on yeah. it right <laughs> yeah So uh, finally, uh, all, all the weight parameters for this uh, scoring function are optimized for the ground truth data first, and then uh, fine-tuned for the uh, prediction data. And so uh, we could achieve 1.5% uh, of ID uh, mismatch error rate uh, in average uh, for the ground truth bounding boxes. Okay, so that's all from my side. Yeah, thank you, Katasan. Uh, yeah, uh, so at any point, like, uh, uh, please let us know if you have any questions related to this, or if you uh, had a, have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah. So, uh, so let's move to uh, next slide. Ah, no, okay, we have a question in uh, object tracking. Uh, so, when you tra train object tracking models. Uh, what's your loss function in what condition uh, we can say that the model is well enough uh, this was a question from uh, sorry i cannot pronounce your name but uh, tian liang san uh, so i i didn't uh, use uh, any uh, deep uh, neural network but i uh, so, uh, in this case the loss function corresponds to this uh, score function maybe mm -hmm. and uh, i so the parameters to optimize is basically uh, the weight uh, for uh, box distance score and box uh, size difference score and image similarity score. And these uh, weights uh, are optimized via uh, simple grid search. Ah, so for the, uh, about, this was a question from uh, Mayank. Uh, so let's take this question first. For correlations, were there KL divergence uh, utilized for the HSV histograms? Uh, no. Hmm. Okay, and uh, thank you. And then one more question: Was there any specific requirement for ID if we run, if we are re sorry, if we are running uh, detection on every frame? Uh, why is there a need for re-ID? Uh, so object detection only detects the objects uh, in in uh, object level. So if there are two different cars, the object detection only detects those car binding boxes. And for the identification, we actually um, we would like to check the uh, objects in instance level. So if there are two cars, the, each of them should have different IDs. So that's why we still need the identification. Okay, uh, let's move to uh, next uh, slides. So, uh, so uh, that was all uh, about like the two phases, right? Like object detection and object tracking. Uh, once uh, object after, com so the next uh, step was to combine object detection and object tracking models together. So uh, what we did is like we did a dummy test run and a dummy submission to test this pipeline. Uh, it it uh, yeah it took some time for integration and submission, uh, which we thought like we might ha could have saved this uh, by just. Uh, doing this uh, earlier at an earlier step. But yeah, uh, like uh, time really becomes very precious when it comes to deadline. So uh, we did submit our dummy submission and then everything got figured it out. Uh, so uh, first, uh, we first figured out the like the different parameters uh, for the model, which we want to fine tune. Like uh, here you can see left and right flip or the contrast adjustment, which Alicia talked about. Uh, then also we had set an NMS threshold for car and pedestrian. So we populated all the different patterns uh, by deciding the range of values on each of the parameters. And then uh, this Excel sheet is a quick snapshot of uh, all the experiments, uh, which we listed for different patterns. Uh, in total, we had total 40 different uh, experiments and we assigned these experiments among each of us. Uh, so in order to speed up the evaluation of the model. So uh, while this uh, Excel sheet gave us the uh, quantitative judgment on the model, uh, we also needed uh, a qualitative judgment on the model. So for this uh, purpose, we overlaid the model output uh, on the original videos and uh, watched the entire videos. So here in this image, you can see, uh, I think this was the question earlier, uh, someone had asked like, what is the black box, right? Like, so this black box is the ground truth data. Uh, for uh, the all pedestrians and cars. And uh, this uh, colored box are the object detection output. Uh, the If the color remains same throughout frames in the video, that means it has the same uh, tracking ID. 
if the tracking id changes uh, then uh, we would uh, then we would uh, know uh, the tracking id of that particular object has changed so the color will change so uh, this way i think we could uh, visualize uh, uh, our output of the model uh, it helped us to uh, decide the model uh, qualitatively we also did some other visualizations uh, like for example on each of the boxes we also had some score uh, of detection for each of the boxes like for example here the red is the ground truth while the green is the prediction with a score on the top of it we also did some small uh, variations like uh, displaying the area of the box or a number of uh, pedestrians in each frame of the box dynamically in the video so that kind of visualization uh, helped us to improve a lot so based on all these uh, um, uh, testing and uh, testing pipelines uh, i would like to uh, alicia to uh, do a quick conclusion of uh, uh, the project yeah 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 sure yeah. and so there 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 are some conclusions um, after this competitions and we would like to share some of them and let me start with the first one. And so the, in the first one, you, you could read this. Do, do not overfit on public data set, uh, public test set. And uh, let me explain what is what was the public test set. Uh, in, in the competition, there were two different test sets. And for, first one was public one, and the second one was, was the private one. And public test set, um, so the models uh, submitted were evaluated on public test set during the competition. And once the competition finished, and the real ranking was uh, evaluated on uh, private test set. So when we say do not overfit on public test set, uh, means that during the competition, you can see your rank, you can see your scores according to the public test set. And when you do a lot of experiments, and, and let's say um, if, if experiment A got 0 0.88 and your experiment B got 0 0.88, 80, 89 then if, if you choose this 89 even though it was not uh, even if if didn't have like very a strong uh, reason to 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 get better performance then you will you will probably do overfit on public test set and in in, in this competition it was indeed the case uh, for example the guy who was leading the uh, leaderboard uh, who was on the first um, place got fifth place after this re-evaluation on private test set and the the guy who was second uh, got the fourth place and during the competition we got we were at sixth place and after the private test set uh, evaluation and uh, we moved to the third place so i think this is this was one of the most interesting conclusions we got from this competition and another one is taste test time augmentation um, uh, like we we usually use augmentations during the training but uh, it's real rare that we use augmentation in test time but in this competition we could uh, we did have enough um, enough power enough um, uh, memory enough uh, speed then that's why we tr just uh, try test time augmentation which means like during the test uh, running and we feed the original frame as well as the um, augmented frame and the, the third one is adaptive nms which is like um, after the object detection uh, you usually run the non-maximum suppression to um, and to remove some noisy bonding box detections and uh, like we usually use the same uh, predefined NMS threshold for each classes. But uh, in this competition, uh, we did a very good analysis and uh, di used different non-maximum suppressions for different classes. And this was very important because like when you, s in, in this videos, like pedestrians, uh, bonding boxes are overlapped a lot, but uh, in for car bonding boxes, they are like far away and so that's why we need different non-maximum separation for different classes. And yeah, the, the next very important point was data exploration. And <clears throat> like when, so two of us were training the object detection and tracking and the other guys were like doing data exploration um, continuously. In the, by doing this, we got some uh, intuition, some, um, and conclusions uh, from the data. For example, uh, so 
I think Ben found this uh, heuristic that uh, there were no objects on the top and on the bottom of the frames. So that's why if if the model detects something on the top and on bottom of the frame, we can just neglect neglect it because there was like literally no objects uh, in any video. And another thing is like we had it was also very interesting like. Uh, uh, someone should keep track of everything like reporting and what sh what next step should be done and like this kind of uh, excel excel um, experiment tracking and and also like try to find critical improvements according to your data uh, you know like every uh, data domain has its specific um, features its specific um, properties so that's why like uh, after after like uh, analyzing the data, you could find very critical improvements, and and according to this uh, critical improvements, you can build some heuristics, and uh, to to get some heuristics, you need to analyze your data very well, and and do not underwrite any idea at all. So some very like uh, small uh, improvements may. Uh, can make you win the win the competition, and I think there are some questions in the chat. Yeah, so uh, I think the first question was like, uh, do you use any specific tool for experiment oh, okay. management? Okay. Uh, so that I think, experience. yeah, we we just use like a Google Sheets, uh, <laughs> very simple stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think others also suggested like maybe uh, going ahead. I think uh, using frameworks like MLflow and. Uh, which uh, Jose suggested, and also uh, I think Lin uh, Lin also suggested like MLflow plus DVC is a good uh, uh, good framework to do this kind of like continuous testing and submissions. Yeah, yeah, the, it's quite important to have the knowledge about these topics uh, when it comes to handling uh, projects. 